So I have the big honor to announce our next speaker, Doug Ethel. Doug is the founder and CEO of Locadia Therapeutics, which is a preclinical stage company developing early diagnostics for Alzheimer. He also is the founder of Imogen Bio, a focus on brain tumor um, oncology. Today he will discuss how disturbances in the brain's waste elimination process contribute to the development of Alzheimer and the aging of the brain. Welcome, Doug. Thanks. Does this work? Great. Uh, thanks for inviting me to this beautiful conference. Wonderful to be here. Uh, we work on a fundamental mechanism for brain health that clears insoluble metabolites, detritus, and exosomes that are in between the cells. That's the interstitial spaces of the brain. Aging deteriorates this clearance mechanism, which allows metabolites to accumulate, triggering inflammatory processes and a spectrum of pathologies found in Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's, and frontal temporal dementia, among others. Today, I'll explain um, how aging of this mechanism seeds Alzheimer's pathology and how we can fix it with a tiny implantable device like this one right here. OK, where are my slides? OK. So let's start at the beginning, around 1900, with a German woman, Auguste Dieter. She started acting strangely. She was confused, had trouble remembering things, and frequently got lost. These days, we'd call that mild cognitive impairment. Well, she got worse and became paranoid that someone was trying to kill her, so they took her to the Frankfurt Asylum, where she was seen by Dr. Elois Alzheimer. He diagnosed her with senile dementia, common in the elderly, but she was only 51, so he followed her case closely until she died in 1906. Now, Alzheimer was a, a, a classic, actually one of the best neuropathologists ever. So when he analyzed her brain, he saw, as you can see on the right-hand side here, uh, atrophy or wasting away of the cerebral cortex due to the loss of billions of neurons. He also found these little Eiffel Tower-shaped structures here. These are neurofibrillary tangles, right? They're cytoskeletal elements that even persist after the cells de deteriorated and degenerated, as well as plaques. These are waxy deposits that sit in the interstitial spaces of the affected brain regions, OK? Now, plaques, tangles, and neurodegeneration don't suddenly appear everywhere. They start first in this area highlighted in orange. So if you take the brain and you chop it down the middle, we're looking at the medial, OK? At the bottom is the medial temporal lobe uh, in orange. And the pathology takes a while to get going, right? It's like making a campfire. There's dried leaves and twigs, a little smoke. And after a few years, it turns into a self-perpetuating pathology that spreads first to the limbic, adjacent limbic areas and eventually consumes the entire cerebrum. It's like a campfire that turns into a wildfire. Now, the big question is, what's so special about this little orange area on the left that allows this pathology to seed in the first place? And can we stop it and prevent it from going on? Now, the, the answer is a basic mechanism that all organ systems have to do, and that's clear their interstitial spaces. And think of a stream in a forest. Leaves fall down, and they accumulate on the ground. But if they fall in the stream, they get carried away. Now, later in the summer, the stream starts to dry up, but the leaves keep coming. Eventually, a point is reached where more leaves fall in than can be carried away. Now, if you look at the... I don't have a laser here, do I? If you look at the bottom, uh, bottom left image, there's a little rock in there, in the stream. So if that's a cell in the body, it's in homeostasis. Things are getting cleared away fine. But on the right-hand side, the rock in the stream is surrounded by a slew of factors it ordinarily wouldn't see, right? And it stresses the cell and causes it to do things it ordinarily wouldn't, right? It might affect the ubiquitin proteasome pathway that degrades proteins, resulting in polyubiquitylation, say, of alpha-synuclein that doesn't get broken down, and it coalesces into Lewy bodies, and Parkinson's and, and dementia with Lewy bodies. Or perhaps it it affects the phosphatases that dephosphorylate intermediate filaments like tau, 
right? We get hyperphosphorylated tau, which turns into neurofibrillary tangles. So the solution for this clearance mechanism starts in the blood, right? The tiniest capillaries have little holes or fenestrations or gaps that allow plasma to slowly ooze out into the tissue where it's referred to as interstitial fluid. Now, the fluid flows around through the cells, picking up the large macromolecules that don't diffuse easily into the blood vessels, okay? And pieces of apoptotic cells, et cetera. It carries all that stuff to open-ended lymphatic vessels, right? And they, it goes right in. The lymphatic vessels take it up, and then it's referred to as lymph. Eventually, the lymphatic system takes it back to the bloodstream, okay? Now, this system clears the tissues, but if there's a problem with it, there are 20 or so proteins that can form amyloid folds. And when they accumulate to a certain level, they wrap around each other like carpet fibers, making fibrils, all right? This condition is called amyloidosis, and it can occur, occur in many tissues in the body. But when it occurs in the brain, we call it a plaques, okay? But it's the same thing, okay? Oops. Yeah, that's it. Now, the brain has a, a little different way to do this because the smallest capillaries aren't allowed to make holes. The blood-brain barrier protects the brain from blood-borne pathogens, so plasma cannot go there. Instead, the brain makes a special interstitial fluid called cerebrospinal fluid, which it produces in these four gray ventricles in the middle of the brain. It makes about half a liter a day, right? Some of it goes between the ventricles, but most of it percolates out slowly. It goes through the white matter tracks quickly and slower through the gray matter, carrying this detritus and debris to the outer surface of the brain, to the subarachnoid spaces, thin, thin uh, chambers on the surface of the brain. Okay, so let's look at the area where Alzheimer's begins, down at the bottom here, okay? If we look at the temporal lobe, which is that structure, looking at it from underneath, Right? The medial temporal lobe's at the bottom of this middle image, and the green shows how the CSF flows. So it goes out to the outer surface, and then it goes toward the front, where there's a rudimentary funnel formed by the lateral olfactory stria. Right? It follows that down over a bone, and then across the bottom of the, the basal forebrain, another early area hit by Alzheimer's disease. And then it carries it up to the olfactory bulbs. All right. Now, the olfactory bulbs, where does it go from there? Well, the olfactory bulbs sit on a porous bone at the top of the nasal cavity, right between your eyes. Okay? It, the holes accommodate odor receptors that are in the olfactory epithelium in the nasal cavity, right? And so they detect the smell, but they have a little process. They send the signal up to the olfactory bulb, and these holes accommodate those nerves. Okay? Now, the cribriform plate, looking at it from the top, looks like this, right? It's a depression in the, the base of the skull, right? Like a paired depression, and it's got holes, and in the middle, there's that structure that sits up. It's CG, it's Christigalli, it's the rooster's comb, is how they called it. Now, we've looked at more than 600 human cribriform plates, and if we look at the apertures, the holes, we see the porosity is pretty stable until you get to the fifth decade and then it starts to go down, okay? Looking at it another way, here's a heat map. Now, on the left heat map, it's people 55 and younger, and on the right, it's people 65 and over. Now, if you look on the left, the, uh, the white and red, that's the highest probability that there'll be a, an aperture in that spot. Now, notice how it decreases in people in the older set. Shown another way on the far right, on the left bar, that's the the total cross-sectional area in gray of the apertures in people 55 and younger and people 65 and over, and the one on the far right, that's people with Alzheimer's disease. Okay, you can read about this in a preprint in MedArchive. Now, the cribriform plate, um, the image on the left here is a reconstruction of 2,900 slices from a high-contrast micro-CT that's been contrast enhanced. Um, and they're taken from images like the one above. That's just one image. And that image goes right through the little bumpy structure, the Christigalli. So if we look at the top, 
where it says AC, that's the Christigalli there. And then if you look straight down from there, there's an indication CN. Those are the odor receptors, the, the light gray ones. They're coming up from the nasal cavity, right? And they're going through the cribriform plate and going right up to the, the right there, where SAE is. That's where the olfactory bulb would be if it hadn't been removed in this sample. Okay, so they're carrying your signals up there. Now notice around those nerves on the right, there's dark areas. Those are fluid-filled areas. Those are channels that are continuous with the subarachnoid space containing the, uh, the olfactory bulb. So the CSF is coming from the medial temporal lobe. It's going along the olfactory system to the cribriform plate, and then it's going down into the apertures this way. So if you look at the image below, we can see the blood vessels in red. In gold, those are the nerves coming up. And in blue, those are the subarachnoid evaginations going down. Okay? If we put those together, one of the interesting things is, if we took a slice right through the white one on the bottom and then broke it in half, we would see the apertures are connected with conduits that run from the front to back. And in fact, inside the Christigalli, there's a cistern in there, and CSF in there is continuous along the, the conduits into a, a manifold in the back. If we put all that together as a negative image, the, the um, Cribros watershed looks like this, okay? It's a, an, an elegant one-way valve system, right? It keeps the pressure from above from draining all the CSF into the nasal cavity. So we've got four or five, depending on how big your head is, four or five inches of water, right, fluid in, uh, in the brain. So this water column goes down, and this thing sort of regulates and makes sure the CSF goes out slowly. It also prevents things from going back, because if you sneezed, you don't want to have pathogens going into the brain. So it prevents that as well. So it's, a, it's an elegant system. We, we discovered it. Now, clearing CSF through the cribriform plate is hardly a human-specific thing. Here's the skull of a gorilla in red. It shows you the cribriform plate. And uh, compare that, though, to an armadillo, the top and on the left, and a dog on the right. The cribriform plate is quite large in that because olfaction is very important for survival, right? You take Molly here. When I take her to the park, it's an olfactory sensation for her. She can smell a dog has been there. It's peed on this spot. It's male. It's female. It's dominant. It's submissive. It's sick. It's an estrus, right, from one whiff. Now, that's very important for her survival, but in our case, we have a larger brain, so the olfactory systems become relatively less important. So it's smaller. If you look on the gorilla, it's small. But those older areas of the brain that are in the medial temporal lobe, the hippocampus, the amygdala, entorhinal cortex, those all still use the original way to clear CSF. So our structure is very small, and it's susceptible to age-related changes, because we probably only evolved to live 40 or so years. OK, so the question is, if you take an animal that has a larger cribriform plate, and they never get Alzheimer's disease. What if we block the cribriform plate? So that's what we did. Our team of human neurosurgeons took ferrets, right, made a small window in the snout, right, pulled tissue off the cribriform plate, and blocked the holes with dental cement. Now, only half of the holes. We didn't, didn't block everything, right? And then we tested them for something that happens early in Alzheimer's disease, and that's loss of spatial temporal memory, right? You get lost frequently. That's usually how Alzheimer's cases emerge. Grandma loses her way home from the store, and people search for her for hours. Okay? So we tested that in the ferrets using tunnel mazes, because ferrets chase rabbits down holes. So they ran through the tunnel. We did it every month for six months. So the ferrets were otherwise completely fine. Okay? And this is what we saw. So the control. You can see the trend line. This is two months to six months on the x-axis, and the y-axis is how long it took them to solve the maze. Right? And we're only interested in the last two trials of the day. Um, so you can see the trend line for the blue goes down. They kind of figure it out. You know, They solve the maze. But the occluded animals, they take longer and longer to solve the maze. So they don't really have that good spatial temporal memory. 
All right, another interesting thing is when we pulled the brains out, and this is looking at the brain from underneath, right? And if you look on the right-hand side, it's a control ferret. In the middle, on the left of that, there's a green highlight. That's the medial temporal lobe homolog. It's called piriform cortex, same thing. Um, and then there's a white band going from there up to the green area on the top, which is the olfactory bulb. And then the line connecting them is the lateral olfactory stria. Right? Compare that on the control animal on the right to the left. You'll see that the medial temporal lobe is smaller and smoother, just like an atrophy in an Alzheimer's brain. Okay? We have a 40% loss of the medial temporal lobe equivalent and the olfactory bulb, as well as the lateral olfactory stria. And all we did was to block CSF from going out the cribriform plate. Okay, so how do we translate this study, which we think shows quite well that this mechanism can be induced, into humans? Well, in the 600 subjects we did, 570 of them were live subjects in Project Cribros. So we sat them in front of a, a cone beam CT, which you can get in many dental offices. It's a 20-second low-dose scan, and we looked at the cribriform plates. Now, here's a great example. This is three subjects in one family. In the middle, in orange, this is a 55-year-old woman, and on the left, it's her 26-year-old daughter, and on the right, it's her 75-year-old mother, right? So daughter, mother, grandmother, right? If you look at the daughter, <clears throat> see the holes on the left in the middle, the apertures are, are, are quite clear and clean. And then the mother, they're, they're still good, but they're a little closer. They've been closed a little bit. And then on the grandmother on the right, they're very, very small. This sort of illustrates what we're talking about. Now, when we did the subjects, we also tested them for memory and cognition. Okay, and so this is <clears throat> how it looks. So what we have here at the top, we have age, word, and then deficits. Deficits in word recall, smell, olfaction, um, which happens early in Alzheimer's disease, of course. Um, loss of speed, alternating task, and then on the left is maze. So it's like the, the maze, spatial temporal memory, object recognition, pattern recognition. So in this plot, 90-year-olds <clears throat> are the one on the outside. 20-year-olds are the one in the very middle, the blue in the very middle, right? And the rings that are going out, that's decades, like people in their 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, etc., as they go outward. So how did these three women appear on that plot? Well, the green one, the daughter, you can see she's pretty good, but well, on speed, she's not really that fast at stuff. Maybe she doesn't play video games, but spends time on TikTok, okay? The orange one, her mother, um, also not so quick, but if you look at the bottom left, the STM, the spatial temporal memory, that maze solving ability, um, she's got deficits there. And then you look at the grandmother in blue, well, she's actually faster than both of them, but on the right, she's got a big olfactory deficit. She can't smell very well at all. Right? And on the bottom left, the spatial temporal memory, she's got a big problem with that. So you see, in what's one family, we can see <clears throat> kind of how the progression goes. Right? And so we could theoretically predict how it's going, because we're looking at an anatomical feature and behavioral measures. Right? So here's an example of how we do those. Okay? The top left, this is object recall. All right, so you see the silhouettes of three animals, and it's played much faster than normally. And then recall which ones did you see, right? That one, that one, that one. And this is all touch screen on a, a nice big computer screen, which is great for older subjects. All right, here's a maze example, right? So you go through the maze, and there's numbered doors. Which door in which maze, right? Okay, so if you want to do these, <clears throat> you can take the whole memory test if you have an Apple or an iPhone or an iPad, you can go to the App Store and download it for free. It's a Procogni memory tracker. And there's something in there called the memory test. But I warn you, it takes about 15 to 20 minutes. You can't go away and come back. You have to do it all at once. And um, this is what our results look like. You won't get this. Um, here's an example on the x-axis. You go from 20 to 90 years of age, our subjects in Project Cribros. And you can see how the deficits accumulate as you, as you get older. Spatial temporal memory on the top 
in the blue, pattern recall, object recall, and the other ones down below. Okay? We also saw a great, very strong correlation with people who had problems solving mazes and had olfactory problems. And this one on the bottom, loss of smell acuity is on the y-axis, right? <clears throat> and there are two groups. There's a red group and a blue group. The red group, they performed very poorly on the maze. And notice how, as they get older, they also have big problems with smell. And on the, uh, the blue group there, those people did very well on the maze, but they, and they had a very good uh, smell, sense of smell. Okay? So we have all this data from hundreds and hundreds of subjects. We put it together into a, um, a mixed input, multi-dimensional machine learning algorithm. Right? So we take those things and we can predict what their brain age is. So on the x-axis, we have the chronological age, and on the y-axis, we have the predicted brain age. So the red line that goes diagonally, that's the perfect correlation, right? And the, the green bars, the green lines, that's one standard deviation away. So everybody is, most people are in between those. But the people on the very top, on the left-hand side, uh, those are people with mild cognitive impairment and, uh, and Alzheimer's disease and other dementias, okay? So what we do in our, our preparing for our clinical study, we come up with a report for subjects. We have the behavior, we have the anatomy, personal history questions like, did you ever break your nose, right? When you're a kid, you get hit by a baseball and uh, your, your coach like wiped off the blood, I'll get out there, you're fine, right? Well, maybe it cracked the cribriform plate because that middle bone in your nose is connected directly to it. And if it deviates, it might age differently and become more ossified on one side. So, one thing, uh, just specifically for the longevity crowd here, is that maybe a little hack. Let's see here. Oh, we can't. Can you play that video? The gray one? There's a bar at the bottom. Hit it with the mouse. The gray bar, no, on the left. Go over the, the movie on the left. Go up, up, there you go. All right. Okay, this shows you kind of how the CSF gets a help moving through the brain, right? With every heartbeat, it's sort of jiggling and moving, okay? Now, um, we'll go back. Okay, jiggling and moving, okay? And then on the right-hand side there, around the brain in blue is the subarachnoid space. Now, this is a cartoon. In reality, it's very thin, right? There are little cisterns here and there, including the cribriform plate above the cribriform plate. And the fluid, if you're sitting in front of a computer, it doesn't move so much. If you lie down and go to sleep, it sort of shifts because the, you know, the, the inside of the brain is, is sort of gelatinous. Um, and so you'll get a little bit of movement and mixing of that. But the uh, subarachnoid space that goes down, if you look at the bottom where the brain stem is going to the spinal cord, that is continuous all the way down the spine to the bottom of the back, to the lumbar cistern, where you get a spinal tap and they take out CSF. So in reality, you have a two and a half or three foot, depending on your height, uh, water column, right? So if you did, say, uh, the downward dog in yoga, in this case, this woman, the CSF from there is going to go in and it's going to sort of mix up the CSF in the subarachnoid spaces of a subject. Or, do something like I do in the, the morning, you do a 30% incline, but lay there for a couple minutes and tilt the head left and right. And then, of course, you could do the inversion table as well. But anyway, I'm not sure if the, we don't have any data saying this uh, prolongs or, or prevents cognitive decline in dementia, but it's certainly something to think about. Um, but somebody who has a pathological situation like early stage Alzheimer's disease, that's not going to be enough. So we have an intervention. So the little device, oh, here it is. Right. Little device called Arethusta, right? One end goes into the cribriform plate above it, right? Drains fluid, it goes into a tube, and then there's a little pressure regulator below. That all goes into the nasal mucosa, right? Which can easily absorb the CSF, that's not a problem, okay? And then we get a slow draining. Now, see the green area, that's that's the olfactory tract there, right? So it's going to protect the areas from accumulating things above, right, in Alzheimer's disease, the medial temporal lobe on the right and the, uh, 
the forebrain on the left. Now, another syndrome that happens and is similar to Alzheimer's, but happens in younger people, usually from 45 to 65, is frontal temporal dementia. Maybe you heard Bruce Willis has this. Um, the regional distribution is very similar. And we think that there might also be a contribution of cribriform plate CSF egress to that condition. So we'd like to look at that too. And another one is, uh, maybe, maybe you've heard of COVID, right? Starts off with loss of smell. It's a pathological, it's an inflammation um, right in the region where the cribriform plate is, uh, where those olfactory fibers are. So if someone has a long uh, problem with that and there's a lot of inflammation, it could damage, permanently scar, the cribrose watershed, right? And so it'll be interesting to know if five years from now, suddenly there's a big spike of Alzheimer's cases who have long COVID with brain fog. So our clinical trials, uh, right now we're, we're setting up to do, starting in 2024, um, putting the device in 25 and then 150 people with uh, early stage Alzheimer's, really a mild to moderate cognitive impairment. And we'll follow them for two years and then go for an indication for that. Now to do the Alzheimer's study, we just have to continue following those people for another few years as the control subjects will keep becoming more and more Alzheimer's. I mean, we'll get more and more in the control subjects. Also, we'd like to do the long COVID study, FTD, hydrocephalus is, is a low hanging fruit for us. And then brain aging, as you know, it's difficult to get the indication, but if we have an approved FDA device, uh, it would be a lot easier. And then the last thing would be uh, acknowledgements and a, a shameless book, book plug, but uh, that's it. Thank you so much, Doug. I will definitely do more yoga from now onwards. Thank you for that um, sure. hack. Uh, we have approximately four minutes or five minutes of Q&A. Um, so please shoot your questions at Doug. Great, great talk. Uh, as somebody, I mean, I've had bacterial meningitis, I have a fracture in my basal skull, but unfortunately for me, I'm a haemophiliac, so they can't repair it. Um, just a question about those holes. If you, if you followed over time uh, the, uh, an individual, uh, do these holes fill up and new ones open constantly? Is, it, is there an osteoblast, osteoblast uh, playoff? Well, well it's, a, it's a mixture of, of soft, and, soft tissue and bone. I think that the, the nerves are actually required to keep the hole open. So as you're losing smell, you lose that. The ossification, new, new holes don't open up. These form when the original uh, olfactory system grows, right? Because they, you have the, um, the, the olfactory nerves grow and they bundle together and then bone forms around them, right? And so it, it maintains that. Um, but yeah, we want to follow, and that's one of the reasons we've done this study is we're gonna have people come back every few years and scan them, see if we can make a progression of hundreds of people. So, so if, if nerves die, then the hole fills up, is that what you? Uh, if the, the nerve dies, yeah. Yeah, I think, I think that's the case. I think the nerve in the signaling pathway is, is probably a major part of that to keep it open. Many thanks, Doug. Very inspiring. To what extent can this reverse uh, people who are already quite far down the route to these brain diseases? Or is it just a case of preventing people becoming worse? Okay, well, uh, great question. Our, our first goal is to prevent it in people because if we just give it to very late stage patients and we see no effect because it's really just clearing one area, um, our trial is going to be a complete failure. So we're going to do that. And then we'll do later and later people and, and see how that goes. We'll also do these other conditions. And in terms of <clears throat> other pathologies, it's so small and unobtrusive, we can probably put it in other pockets of the subarachnoid space to increase clearance, for example, in the parietal lobe and, and uh, some of the other areas. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't know at this point how late we'll be able to go. Uh, one of the things about Alzheimer's is we're talking about when the pathology first gets going. Later in the disease, there's been massive neurodegeneration, and they're just the neurons aren't there, and they're they're not going to regrow. And uh, and 
arguably it'd be nearly impossible to regrow them um, because just the pattern is made in embryogenesis and all the markers that establish that pattern go away by birth. So. Hi, I've heard um, vitamin B is really important when people get old to keep a cognitive function working well. Mm -hmm. Is there any link with that and those keeping those holes from getting blocked? Do you, do you have um, any idea? Vitamin B blocking, preventing aperture closure? I don't, yeah. I, I don't believe so. Okay. I mean, vitamin, well, one of the things that happens, uh, many old people have uh, deficiencies of vitamin B12 and um, if they're not taken care of very well, they go, you know, the doctor default is, oh, older person, memory problems, oh, it's Alzheimer's. Unfortunately, there's something called um, normal pressure hydrocephalus, which looks a lot like it, but it's very treatable by managing CSF flow. Um, but, uh, but yeah, unfortunately, it's, it's too easy a default for an average GP to do, but no, I, I don't think there's any, anything on that. R really, what we're talking about is like the previous speakers, we're talking about development, and I've really done molecular biology, genetics, and developmental biology for most of my career, so it's kind of ironic I'm doing this physiology now. Um, <clears throat> when you have the development of, of the system, we're talking about it changing, and now it's, it's old, and the olfactory system will regenerate, right, but not de novo. Right. What it will do is the odor receptors regenerate about every two weeks, and then they send their process up the older fibers up to the olfactory bulb. Right. And in the subventricular zone of the brain, the neurons that they're making are actually the older olfactory cells that are playing a role in the upstream part of that. So those are kind of, you get regeneration there, but if you cut it and damage it, there's no way for them to find their path home. Right. So once it's gone, it's gone, and arguably, um, you know, the, the regeneration of the olfactory uh, neurons, they're just replacing the ones that are already there. So you can't just suddenly put in a whole bunch more. They wouldn't know where to go, and uh, it would be a problem. Thank you. All right. If you have more questions, I think you're also going to be available during the day. So thank you so much. Sure. Thank you so much. Thank you. And now I'm super happy.